I'm Michael Bain, and once again, welcome to The Best Defense Survival. With me this week, and they've been with us the entire duration of this COVID-19 emergency, are Dr. William April, Mike Seeklander, Michael Janich, and Rob Pincus. Guys, uh, every week it's, it's something a little bit different here, but uh, it seems to me this week may w we may well be getting close to the cure being worse than the disease. Uh, I wanted to start with Dr. April because you're in New Orleans, and I, I understand now you have to give uh, ID and name and contact information to buy groceries. Well, not exactly, It's a, it, but it is a, a sign of the kind of uh, ad hoc properties of the COVID response. Um, our mayor has uh, recently come out with sort of a unilateral declaration that for non-essential businesses to reopen, meaning businesses like uh, that are not grocery stores or, or drug stores, things like that, they have to keep a customer log, um, which means some kind of name, contact, and trace information for everyone who enters the store, whether they buy something or not. Uh, this hasn't been defined. There's no ordinance that creates it as a, as a legal entity. Uh, there's no enforcement mechanisms. There's no check-in mechanisms. Uh, there's really no backbone behind it except just a generalized unfunded mandate to perform this task. Now, theoretically, it's supposed to help with disease tracking, but does it really mean that if someone enters a store, they're going to be asked to provide ID to buy a cup of coffee or look at a pair of socks? Uh, nobody's really sure. And um, this kind of uncertainty, I think, adds even more to the irritation in the community because these things just don't feel grounded in anything. They feel like more droppings of the good idea fairy. Well, as you can see, I actually got a haircut this week. I had to um, go in the middle of the night to an industrial district in Fort Collins. I, I had to go to a door. There's a little beephole. You knock three times, say, Joe sent you. Now, that's not quite that bad, but uh, there's a capriciousness that seems to be afoot in the country in, in terms of uh, some of these ordinances um, where you see – one of the things we always come down to is, is what is the controlling authority? Uh, this week, Governor Newsom said he's creating an army of 20,000 people and to track contacts. And that army will have the authority to basically take you and force you out of your home into quarantine. So the governor says that army has exactly the same controlling authority as the 89th Street Gangster Crips, which is to say, yeah, they can do it, but there doesn't seem to be any constitution behind it. Mr. Pincus? Yeah, it, the patchwork and the inconsistency is something that, that I've had concerns about since the beginning. You know, we've been talking about it for weeks. There's the frustration that's growing, um, that's being acted out on, on a variety of levels with uh, the, the fact that, that these things do seem so arbitrary and uh, completely unfounded in precedent or in law. In, in most cases, certainly in our lifetime, in our country, um, these kinds of maneuvers and these things that people are doing make no sense to the average human, let alone freedom-loving humans, which honestly most Americans are. We may define freedom and liberty differently, but ultimately I think more and more people are waking up to the fact that this whole thing has gone wrong. And while people may have the best of intentions, and I'm willing to give elected officials and local law enforcement, even business owners, the benefit of the doubt, overwhelmingly, the majority of the time, that they really think what they're doing is a good idea or going to help. Um, but, you know, as soon as I heard this idea of writing down names and, and you know, low na numbers, contact information, whatever it was going to be, the first thing I thought of was, of course, 4473s, right? Um, you know, the, the, the firearms forms that we all have to fill out when we pick up a gun. You know, are those supposed to be maintained? How long are they maintained? Are they protected by HIPAA? Is there any privacy? Do you need a subpoena to see them? I mean, what is what is the nature of this information? And quite frankly, I may want to go into a store and not have that clerk or that manager or that store owner have my contact information. I just may want to go in and, and do my business. Uh, you know, information privacy and security is, is something that we all talk about and we all think about at one level or another. So there's some real concerns with the contact tracing concept and implementation in the first place. Um, but when you start asking, again, the grocery store clerk or the convenience store clerk or the guy who runs the comic book shop to collect the information of everyone that goes in there, they're just asking for trouble. Mr. Janet, just, just so we can be clear going in, why don't you explain 
one more time what the function of a mask is. I think that is uh, a topic of continued debate. So as far as me coming up with a definitive uh, statement of what a mask does or what it doesn't do, um, in general terms, it seems that most people agree that it actually protects the other person more than it protects you. It keeps you from being able to expel things. When we talk about masks and face coverings and all that type of thing, again, they're not all created equal, so you can't lump them all together from a, a functional standpoint. Um, and generally what you're doing in wearing a mask is you're showing respect for somebody else and you're saying, you know what? I'm not going to spew my body fluids in your direction. Um, that's basically what you're achieving with it. As far as it protecting you from anything coming toward you, again, that is uh, a crapshoot depending upon the type of mask that you have and its condition and the fit of the mask on your face and so many other factors that you can't really generalize that. But in general, when you look at it, I say, okay, I'm going to wear a mask out of respect for other people and I'm out of respect for um, like a, a grocery store or something like that where you have tons of people coming in there trying to get uh, supplies and everything for their families, respecting that environment as well as the people within it. That's, that's probably as good as definition as you can get. As, as I've said repeatedly, I'm in a higher risk category. When I go out, I'm wearing a, a 3M N95 respirator that I have, in fact, been trained on how to take on or put on and take off. Um, I, I'm thinking if you're wearing just a bandana that has a Punisher logo on it, it's, it's not going to work all that well for you. Uh, Mr. Seeklander, I mean, this whole mask issue... I understand it, and, and again, I'm, I'm one of the guys wearing the mask, but it is, I believe, adding to the social tension because we can now no longer read what the other person is. You know, we can no longer, uh, the cues that we automatically respond to are gone, and so what that gets replaced with is suspicion and oftentimes fear. I had a, uh, I was on the range with a local uh, police officer. He's actually a SWAT team leader. And I said, hey, man, you know, you or your guys, you're in a convenience store now, and someone walks in with a hat on or a hoodie, maybe it's chilly that day, and a mask on. And I said, How, you know, back in the day, that's a pretty clear signal that something's going on. Or three or four people walk into a bank and – same thing. They have this mask that allows them to be unidentifiable, you know, and theoretically, if you're requiring me to wear a mask, then you really can't require me to take the mask off. I, I'm surprised that I'm not hearing more about that. Personally, not that I want to be a criminal, but now would probably be a good time to be in the criminal element because you can literally walk around or drive around relatively unidentifiable um, you could walk a team of guys into a bank and all have masks on and, you know, case the place for a while. No armed security, no armed police officers you can pick out. Boom, do your deal. Um, I would say, though, personally, I think it does add to the irritation of the average person out there. And I, and I also do believe, you know, like what uh, Janet said about this, this may be out of respect for others, but I'll I'll say this, whether it's right or wrong, I only have a few masks here that are of N95 quality. I have not worn a mask yet. I haven't. Uh, maybe that makes me a bad guy. Maybe um, the audience will be mad at me for saying that, but I'm not wearing one right now. And I'm not saying I wouldn't wear one. I stay pretty much away from folks in general. You know, I may walk by someone at the grocery store, but I haven't worn one yet. So maybe that's shame on me. Um, to be honest with you, I think a lot of people might be mirroring my emotion as well, though, is feeling irritated that they may be forced to wear a mask. That said, though, if we ever get consistency, and we talked about that in the pre-show, it seems that that rule or the, the use of a mask has been very inconsistent in terms of what we've gotten from the authorities. If someone says one day, hey, here's our strong recommendation or requirement, I'll comply because I like to follow the law or I believe in following the law. Um, so a lot of complications with the masks. Just to add a point, uh, a friend of ours, uh, Daryl Bolke, who is a trainer, 
had to go to his bank and made an appointment to go to his bank and they made a, a point of telling him that he had to be masked and so uh, apparently he couldn't resist it he showed up in a balaclava that just had eye slits and dark glasses because he said he always just wanted to walk into a bank exactly like that but I, on, on a more serious note um dr april uh, this uh, to me a culture uh, a culture is, is a, a creature founded on a certain level of trust between the people within the culture and also the people and the government, whom the people are supposedly uh, put in place and answers to the people. And a whole lot of these small items are chipping away at what I would think of as the pivot points of culture. Well, it's, you know, the basis of that of that exchange of trust is the just consent of the governed, right? That we agree that what government is doing is is good, that, it, that it's for the general good. And there's no doubt that, that, that a couple of things are happening. You know, are, are we getting more cynical as we're, we're subjected to more and more information, less and less filtered? Yes, um, I think we're getting more and more cynical. But second, these little insults... Um, do chip away at our willingness to grant credibility, to, you know, the, our willingness to grant the notion that if the government is doing something, by definition, it's going to start off being a good thing with good intentions. Well, that's becoming more and more of a sliding scale. Um, it was always a generous assumption that from top to bottom, the government was the best people doing the best they could. Well, uh, that's really sliding now. Um, as we see more and more stuff that just seems ad hoc and unstructured. And I think that gives rise uh, to a sense of unease that people will fill with their own certainty, even if it's dead wrong certainty. Mr. Janich, we're, we're here in Colorado and basically um, the counties, the, the county health officials have been given uh, uh, pretty much unlimited power to run their counties as, as they would like. Uh, my concern here in, in the county I'm in where um, what, 340, 350,000 people, we've had 15 deaths of which, uh, I'm sorry, 19 deaths, five of which never were positive for COVID. They just put them in the mix. I don't know, they got hit by a car, they needed an extra death. My specific objection is, is I am essentially now being ruled by someone who was not elected who is not subject to any of, if you want to know, if you want to know something about Michael Bain or you want to know something about Michael Janich or anybody on this panel, Google us and our life will lay out before you. But we now have an, an, an unelected official who in his statements that he writes out is, is they're not very well written. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a writer. And I think everybody here is a writer and there's an overwhelming tendency to when you read something badly written, you wonder if perhaps it's been badly thought out. Um, where, where do you stand on that, Mike? I'm, you know, being former military, uh, associating with a lot of folks who are uh, law enforcement, leadership is something that um, I have a high standard for. So when you have somebody who's a true leader, who's giving you good information, who's giving you good guidance, who inspires you to believe what they're saying because it is articulately worded, because it makes sense, because it seems that it's well thought out. That's what we're really lacking at, at this time. For somebody to get up there, I mean, even if somebody said, you know what, we don't have all the answers, but based on our analysis of the situation, based on what our experts say, um, this is the best course of action. This is what we should do, and this is what we're asking you to do. With a leader, everybody understands what they're trying to achieve, and they work together toward that goal. With a manager, you've got a bunch of people who have questionable credentials who are simply saying, you know, do it this way because I'm in charge. And what's really disturbing, I guess, as far as like the county uh, you know, deferring everything to the counties here in Colorado is that some of the counties have specifically said, look, we don't have the same level of public health authorities that the state has. So we can't be making those decisions. They're admitting that they really don't have the expertise to make the decisions, yet they're still making the decisions because they have to. Um, by definition, that entire thing is just a shit show. Uh, there's, there's no... <clears throat> 
no real thoughtful process behind it. Nobody has enough information and nobody is, is really skilled or qualified enough to make educated decisions. It's a very scary thing. Um, it's a situation where, where decisions were made based on models um, and the models, if you look at the Imperial College model, that was the model that drove the national lockdown, stay at home for two weeks. The Imperial College model not only has been knocked down, it's been completely discredited. Uh, and essentially the primary author has resigned or was fired because while he said everybody shelter in place, uh, he didn't. Um, but yet we're still operating off that. Uh, one, one of the points that I, I note here is I now have stricter lockdown uh, provisions than I had in the height of the epidemic when it was really burning hot. Let's go back three weeks ago when we said we're in the heart of it, we're in the fire. We now have much stricter stay at home provisions, even though it's very clear that we're on the downside. Rob, I know you've been uh, swapping back and forth. We're dealing with, uh, also we're dealing with mask etiquette. I have been asked to take off my mask once to prove that I look like my driver's license. Uh, interestingly enough, at a liquor store. Uh, how is this working for you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. The first time that I had my head shaking moment on the uh, mask issue and identity was when I was going through the stop at Texas. They had a, a stop. I don't know if it's still there, but they had a uh, checkpoint set up between Texas and Louisiana. And uh, as I approach and I've been wearing the mask in public spaces for the most part. If people haven't been watching or if we haven't made it clear, I have been wearing the face cover uh, for about three weeks now in grocery stores and things like that. So on a drive through the Louisiana-Texas border, uh, the state trooper who came up to the car to talk to me wasn't wearing a mask. Now, most of them were. This guy in particular wasn't. Um, around this, this is about three weeks ago. At the same time, when I went through uh, the Denver International Airport at one point, all of TSA, it, almost like they were told not to wear masks. None of them were wearing masks. Now, the airport was mostly empty. And that's evolved to the point where um, I got pulled over to have a conversation about speed limits and the law by a state trooper uh, about a week and a half ago here in Colorado, and she was wearing a mask. I was wearing a mask. She complimented me on my mask. I didn't mention anything about hers. And after our little meeting, we went our separate ways. So we see an evolution and we see inconsistency. Um, the most frustrating part of the masks in public for me really occurred yesterday um, of this entire time when I was on my first mandatory mask wearing flight. You had to have your face covered. Uh, TSA didn't ask me to reveal the rest of my face going through. He looked at my license. I don't know what he was particularly looking for. He did, um, as they do all, quite often when I'm traveling with Toddler Pincus, he asked her her name um, because, you know, they're worried about child trafficking and whatnot. So uh, asking a toddler what her name is is fine. Did not ask her to pull her face cover off. The person I saw yesterday that, whose face I saw the most uncovered was actually the flight attendant on the mandatory face covering flight. She would pull her mask down 75% of the time she wanted to talk to somebody. And you, you could see how annoyed people were with her behavior, whispering about it. And finally, about two hours in the flight, somebody said something to her. And she said, oh, well, I just want to make sure you can hear me because my information is important. That was her answer. The guy at Target did that to me three weeks ago. And it's an 18-year-old kid working at Target. And I didn't worry about it that much. But when you have the flight attendant who's responsible for the safety of the flight and is supposed to be learning how to do this and how to do it right, not able to do it right. I, I get why people are so incredibly frustrated with the whole face covering thing. And I think it really falls on us as individuals to be polite, to be clear about our intentions, about our concerns, about our requests. If we're business owners or if we're employees asking someone who's coming to our store to wear the mask or for some reason you need to remove the mask, we really have to be extra patient and extra communicative, remembering that three quarters of our facial expression are gone. I mean, most of you can tell a lot by the eyes, obviously from emotion, but we've lost a great deal of communication and it's incredibly important that we communicate even more right now. Dr. April? Well, even more to expand on Rob's point, even more than being polite, even more than being you know, consistent, uh, part, part of that responsibility is recognizing that you're a high node individual. A flight attendant comes into contact with hundreds of people a day 
if she becomes ill, she is a serious disease vector. Uh, and so the mask is uh, to protect the rest of the people that she's going to encounter. Part of her job is to recognize, I am not a regular person standing on a street corner. I am a potential vector, and I must have a duty of care toward the people who cannot avoid interacting with me. So it goes beyond politeness to actual duty as a citizen. I think it's pretty fair to say. Well, it seems reasonable to me, Mr. Seeklander. I mean, it seems to me this, that this inconsistency, we talked about inconsistency for 14 years on the best defense and how inconsistency is a bad thing. Consistency is, is what you want to do in your training, in your everyday life. And now we're in this situation where, where it's all in the air. Well, I think it is all near. I think that, and I think that a lot of the the rules and the controls that are maybe not well thought out are because idle minds. You know, right now, strangely enough, it's so weird as we go through this week by week because we're meeting. Now you can kind of see our trend. I mean, it was just weeks ago where we were looking, not looking forward to, but talking forward to. Hey, this thing's about to peak. What's this going to look like? You, you know, if you have the opportunity and money, go to the stores and get a little more food, just plan for this because it's about to peak. And, and we're, we're thinking about this, you know, the eye of the storm is about to pass over and the other side is going to hit us. Weirdly enough, we're there again. It's like idle minds. It's like, okay, now things are reopening. Now we know if this contagion is there on the doorknobs, it's getting spread again. And we also know we have a factor of four, six, seven, eight days before we start to see what that is going to affect or how, what, what effect is going to take place there. So now, once again, it's weird. It's like we're waiting for the eye of the storm passed over again. We're waiting for the other side. So I don't know. What, what do we do? You know, uh, it, it also, we're seeing the after effects of things that I didn't predict. I don't know if any of us predicted. I don't know if you've been to your local uh, grocery stores, but the meat shelves are pretty much bare. You know, you're talking about pork plants and chicken plants that – have ultimately shut down to an extent, even though the president mandated them to stay open. But you know, who knows how many other after effects are going to happen? And if this thing is as long term as it we predicted, we've said this, man, what's going to happen in October and November? You talk about fed up and pissed off about masks right now. Let's see what happens in October and November. You know, Mr. Janet, it, it seems to me that that a lot of this could be helped if, if there was a schedule toward ending stuff as opposed to a, a, a revised schedule, a revise of the revise of the revise, when does it end? Again, you know, we would hope that there would be some type of schedule like that. But one of the things we've talked about here before is also just the dynamics of the difference between New York City and rural Montana. Um, so, you know, to a degree, when you look at breaking things down at a county level, that makes sense. Uh, because when you look at a county, with the exception of, you know, big municipalities within it, that's kind of a handy level of government where you can say, okay, in this somewhat, you know, homogenous area, we can make wise decisions based on the nature of our, our community. That kind of makes sense. The problem is that there are no guidelines that are being given to the counties to say, okay, this should be your decision-making process. Uh, you know, you could, <clears throat> if you take all these things into consideration, if you take these guidelines into consideration, if you look at your uh, specific uh, circumstances and then come up with a set of, of rules and regulations or guidelines for, for behavior for your county, that would make sense. Um, but there is no fount of information that is reliable enough to even provide that. That's the, I think the biggest problem. We really don't have that leadership that we need to say, okay, you know, here's some principles to work with. Take these principles, apply them to your locality, take them and apply them to your situation and then make wise decisions. At least there you've got information to work with. Instead, we're grasping at straws. Dr. April. Well, I think it, 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 it very much building on what Michael says, what's happening is a, a failure of leadership, but also a failure of fundamental belief in the federal system. Uh, we're supposed to have a tiered system with uphill and downhill flow. It's not purely oppositional, where every municipality opposes what the county is trying to do. 
and the county opposes what the state's trying to do, and the state opposes what the federal government is trying to do. We want nice, responsive local systems, but that are also receptive uh, to input from higher level expertise. I do think it's better when local uh, solutions get uh, are arrived at uh, at the local level, but at the same time, expertise is not generalized. And so we want the counties, let's say, to be able to draw on the brain power of the state. We want the state to be able to draw on the brain power of the federal government. But it requires that everybody take a deep breath and presume that the, that the political uh, entity directly above them is not out to screw them over. Because what happens then is the federal camp and the local camp then go to opposite corners and start fighting. The problem is the population is in the middle of that fight and we're not being served. Um, I think that's, that's, that's clearly the case. And, uh, you know, un unfortunately, for better or for worse, I think everybody right now is going on on what are the ulterior motives of the people involved. Uh, when you have uh, uh, the presidential candidate, Joe Biden, say, what a wonderful opportunity this virus is to fundamentally change America. You're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I didn't sign up for fundamental changes. I, I, I as you guys know, I, I'm, I, I don't like experts very much. I've, I've never seen them as particularly expert. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I tend to see uh, ulterior motives when it's an advantage to one side of the political spectrum, to, literally, to keep the country closed. Can we keep the country closed until election day? Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me, personally, to get past that when, uh, um, uh, essentially, I, I, I never trusted government much. I don't trust it at all now, Mr. Pincus. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of the social contract, you know, between individuals, between citizens within communities, inside of our, our households, right? I, I think we're at the point now where clearly politics have set in. Uh, maybe five weeks ago that wasn't the case. Maybe six weeks ago it wasn't the case as much uh, when you had, you know, Cuomo complimenting uh, the president. Even the president recently complimenting the, the mayor or the, sorry, the governor of New Jersey, who's a, a Democrat uh, through and through. Um, we still see glimmers of it. But for the most part, this has become political and it's become this camp or that camp, even at the federal level. Look at Texas. You've got the, the lieutenant governor paying the fines while the state attorneys general is saying the woman should be released immediately while a district judge is just sentenced her to seven days in jail and the local authorities want her to close her business down. I mean, Texas is a perfect example of these layers of government fighting with each other. And I applaud uh, the woman who just said, you know what, I'm going to open my business. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for your opinion. Thanks for your input. We're going to try to do the best we can, but I'm going to open my business the best I can and try to move forward. And I think that's what so many individuals really should be doing. Uh, I call on people to be critical thinkers, to be considerate of their uh, neighbors and to, to move forward and stop waiting for experts and stop waiting for guidance and, and take the best information you can and the people you trust and maybe some of what, uh, you know, your dad said and some of what your neighbor said and some of what your governor said and move forward as best you can because sitting around waiting for layers of government, especially at this point, it, it's just going to grow the frustration and, and make things worse. You know, I'm a, I, we, we talk a lot about states' rights. Now we're talking about county rights and municipal rights, things like that. We have to remember that I think a lot of people in the, in the more libertarian or freedom, conservative, whatever side of the equation, uh, look at states' rights as a, as a freedom issue. They look at it as, as it's, well, it's one level closer to me being free. You also have to remember that that state level of government is a layer of bureaucracy that has control over you and influence over what you can, can't do, or the punishments you'll get for doing things that you want to do sometimes. So we may not always want seven layers above us. We may want a federal system. We, you know, again, leadership, it just keeps coming up. Janet just mentioned it, April's mentioned it, I'll throw it in there too. We haven't had the leadership at the federal level from the White House or from our legislature. Eventually, we're going to have Supreme Court of the United States, I'm sure, ruling on whether these restrictions and punishments were appropriate or not. Um, but right now, I really think more than ever that I can think of in recent history, certainly the individual is the most powerful person in our country. They need to be making the best decisions they can, and they need to be moving forward. Dr. April? But there's a powerful motivation hidden behind the surface. In a crisis, it's human nature to want a big daddy to come in and save the problem. Whether that's the courts or the government, um, we want somebody to come in, and in the middle of a crisis, don't tell me what the procedures are, don't tell me what the rules are, 
I don't have time for the Bill of Rights. This is a crisis, capital C, and I want someone to solve it. Well, that's a dangerous, dangerous uh, perspective for us to take, because I'm pretty sure it didn't say we hold these truths to be self-evident unless things get real bad. Well, let's 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 maybe jump ahead over the political and say, okay, let let's pretend we're the big daddies. Um, you know, we got hundred hundred fifty thousand people that actually watch these roundtables. Um, I'm thinking in terms of. of if we were to define at this point what were the best practices or what, what, what should we know? And, and one of the things that, that struck me as an important thing for adults in the room to say is as we open up, more people are going to die because there's no way around that. Mr. Janich? Yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the, the tragic realities of this entire thing is that it's going to continue to play out. It's going to continue to <clears throat> do what it's doing already, which is people are going to get sick and a significant number of those people are going to die. What the exact figures are, again, until we can shake out everything statistically and, and have enough testing to figure out how many people have actually been infected, you know, we don't have all those numbers. So as we've said before, again, you've got to look at it like, statistically and you say, okay, if you're at risk, take extra precautions. I mean, it's, it's that simple uh, for people who decide, you know, like these, uh, the folks who, are, you know, just want to be outspoken and say, I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I simply want to go back to the way things were because I'm tired of, of what's going on. I get that. I get the frustration. But at the same time, that ignores the fact that we have a serious problem. So if you simply decide to throw caution to the wind and walk out and start French kissing everyone you see, um, you know, if you get sick and you die, you basically, you know, made your choice. Everyone is making their choice throughout this entire process. How you make that choice, what information you choose to listen to, how you choose to, to basically live your life during this crisis, that's what basically defines your risk. And again, you know, we don't have all the answers. So you, all you have to do is make the smartest decisions you can based on being the smartest person you can be. Mr. C. Kleiner, you know, expanding on that, uh, as the, uh, uh, as the, the woman in tech salon owner in Texas said, uh, being able to feed my kids is, is a primary concern to me. So when we start talking about what are the best practices, how are we going to get out there and do that? Uh, to me, I, I, you know, when I look at, uh, I know personally people who've lost their businesses, businesses that I know what they put into it. I know how much it meant to them, and it's gone, and it's not going to come back. The money, the small business loans or anything, like, as one, uh, one woman said to me, she goes, it's great. We got a $1,200 loan. Our mortgage is $1,700 a month. Thanks. But Where's the balance? How is that? How is how are you seeing that balance? Because I know you know we're all small business owners here, every one of us. How are you seeing that balance? First of all, I think that people that are business owners that are making that decision make the decision. I'm I I completely support it. You know, you might be um, you might be arrested, you might be fined. You're going to have to face that. I, I don't disagree with some of those decisions, and I can see that. I'm personally not there. You know, I had some cash reserves. I had some online presence, which kept me going. But I get it. And I'll say this, like I said, in the last two or three shows, I, I haven't received a single thing from this organized government, like literally nothing. My unemployment, my wife's not a single dime at this point in time. So if I was relying on some government entity to pay my bills right now, it would completely fail. And that said, I'm going to go back not to politics, but to leadership, because I think it's so important. I think that everyone watching and listening to this and everyone that goes through this needs to remember, unfortunately, and some of them are good people. Understand, I'm not poo-pooing on them entirely, but generally speaking, these appointed leaders and some elected officials, matter of fact, most of these elected officials, in terms of being a leader, suck. They plain ASS suck. I'm gonna say that out loud for the record, and I can't stand that because, you know, a, a virus has invaded our world. Let's say some advanced race alien decided to attack 
the U.S. of A. right now. Who would you put in charge? Would you put some of these top-tiered military leaders in charge and let them make decision in this in the command authority? And I'm not saying that I want a military militarized government. That's not my point at all. But my point is, most of these elected officials and appointed officials, you know, no no background and no leadership experience. Even as a young basic Marine, if you look at the Marine Corps or the Army or any branch of the military as a fire team leader over four Marines, those four Marines knew exactly who was in charge. As a fire team leader, I knew that the squad leader was in charge and would give me direction. And he was gonna follow whatever the platoon sergeant or platoon leader said, and they were given the commander's intent. So what it does is it's, it forms a leadership cadre where some sort of logical decision based on the mission are passed down the ranks and then everybody works as a team. Our leadership in the country, I think, I, I think generally they're a complete and utter failure. They're independently operating and completely driven by politics. I think politics is probably one of the worst things we could have in a crisis. They're on the record. Dr. April. Well, I think Mike is dead right. It's, it's another appeal of expertise. Politics is hard. In politics, you have to come up with good ideas. Sometimes half the people don't like them, and you have to do a good job of persuading, convincing the people that your ideas are good and should be implemented. It's so much easier to create an authority run by an expert and just hand him or her the power and say, well, we have to let them exercise the power. We don't have time to do it the hard political way of building consensus and convincing people. That's a cop-out. To make the system work, we have to believe in it and require it to work, not short-circuit it at the first sign of crisis. Mr. Pegas? Yeah, I, I think I'm spot on with Seeklander and totally get what Dr. April say and to follow it up. I, I, I also haven't gotten any money, haven't applied for any of the SBA stuff with my businesses. Uh, I'm financially cash flow wise, you know, again, online distance education. I'm missing a lot of revenue from in-person classes, but I could restart them now at a lower scale. And, and I guess going back to what you had said earlier about people, you know, if we were, if we were in charge, I would tell people, as I've done over and over again, you know, start living your life in this new normal. And I get criticism for saying new normal, but, you know, as Dr. April has pointed out several times, we have to stop saying going back. So moving forward, just like we all didn't used to use cell phones, just like given who we are 50 years ago, we probably all would have smoked if we were the same age doing the same kind of things 50 years ago. We don't all do that anymore. Uh, seat belts, we all wear that. We've all experienced new normals. TSA, the way we travel, it's a new normal. We've all gone through this, debit cards, ATM cards, whatever it is. So I, I think we have to accept that we're in another phase of that. And this may be temporary moving forward, but we've got to do it. Finding those ways forward, uh, I would tell everybody right now to start thinking very, very realistically about what your acceptable level of risk is and educate yourself. Somebody just said, be the smartest version of you you can be. I, I would, that almost sounds intimidating to, be, to me. Be well informed, right? That's what I want for the people listening here is be the most well informed person that you can be. And it goes back to something I think I said a couple weeks ago on this show, which is, You've got to look for the opposition to what you want to believe. If you're doing research, don't just research to confirm what you want to hear about masks or no masks or go out or don't go out or go to a restaurant or don't go to a restaurant. Go read what the experts are saying or what the, the popular opinion is that, that is opposite of where you're standing and see if it makes sense to you. And maybe you're going to find a truth in the middle. Maybe you're going to feel even more compelled to do what you originally were going to do, or maybe you'll change your mind, but at least be well-informed and then make a decision and take action. Uh, jumping around a little, Mr. Janich, um, in, in my forays uh, into the wild world out there outside the secret hidden bunker, um, you know, we've talked about kind of increasing tension and things, but one thing I noticed yesterday was um, – an increase in the number of aggressive panhandlers who, by the way, weren't wearing masks. Uh, and, and I see from reading an, an increase in the number of, of, of nickel and dime crimes, which, you know, for the, for the last few weeks have been kind of down. But it, it seems to me that there's a trending line that says, well, if, if, this, is, uh, if this is, in fact, the new normal, how do we uh, operate our business, which our business is petty larceny? 
I, yesterday, I, uh, you know, I was approached by an aggressive panhandler, which, you know, in the middle of downtown Fort Collins, which is not where one would normally expect that situation. Uh, from people that you're talking to, is that consistent, Mr. Janich? Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen that. Um, uh, I used to live in Longmont, now live near there, uh, but lived there for 20 years and was there just recently. And it's been changing over time anyway, as far as the, the overall uh, kind of complexion of, of, the, of the town itself. And um, I saw significantly more uh, panhandlers, more homeless people, more people just, you know, out on the streets. Um, and, you know, the, the panhandling side of it, even though their ordinance is against it, uh, was definitely more pronounced than what I've seen before. Uh, so that seems to be on the increase. It's something that, you know, usually happens around this time anyway, because as the temperatures get warmer and everything, you start to see more and more people. Um, obviously, Colorado is a more popular place for, for the homeless and stuff as well, because at least you can get high here. Um, so, <clears throat> but that aspect of things, I think there are just more people who are homeless. And also, I think to a degree, people who are opportunistic in that way, uh, the panhandling side and everything, when they see a crisis going on where people might tend to be more charitable or more uh, just receptive to, to that type of thing, um, they, they can apply their trade more easily. Dr. April, you were, I, well, you know, you're, you've talked so much about criminals and their motivations. Sure. It's also a pretty clear extension of the, of the sort of open windows theory uh, as there's a, a sense of crisis, as there's a sense of a lack of control, um, you're going to get people uh, where the diminution of any inhibitory pressure on their behavior is going to bring them up and out. And also, the number of people on the street is less. There are fewer eyeballs to watch for misconduct, and you're going to see conduct pop up, misconduct pop up. Well, I think uh, that's a very good point, because if, if you're a panhandler, that's your job. Your job is to make that money on a daily basis. And that makes perfectly good sense why I would see yesterday more, more and a larger number of aggressive panhandlers because there's fewer marks. Uh, that becomes well, a critical issue. And also, addiction never sleeps. Uh, the, the overlap of uh, street drug addiction and, and street drug aggressive panhandling behavior, they go hand in hand. Um, as my need for the drug that uh, addresses my withdrawal is continuous and there are fewer and fewer opportunities uh, to, to panhandle money, uh, my intensity has to go up. Uh, if my job as an addict is not to get sick. And uh, if there are fewer people to get money from, I have to put the pressure on the ones I can get to uh, in a much more direct way. That's, uh, and, and not only that, we've now created a giant machine in the United States to drive depression, which drives opioid addiction. Um, Absolutely. Opioid you, addiction is more than anything else, a, a, a misery index. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all that as people are more and more miserable, they seek the vacation of opioids. Mr. Seeklander, that, that, uh, that tells us that, at least it does to me, and I, I'm perhaps not the most optimistic person out there. Uh, I believe the Times of London once referred to me as the most depressing man in the United States. Uh, but you guys love me anyway. But, you know, Mr. Seeklander, I mean, what that tells me is the situation over the next few weeks is going to deteriorate as from terms of, of a criminal situation, petty criminal situation, even a home burglary situation. Yeah, I would, I would probably expect that. Once again, don't want to be negative and predict more bad things. But if you just logic through it, I mean, heck, you know, I, I know I have relatives that have just gone from laid off to fired. You know, these companies, as they come back, they're going to be trimming the fat as much as they possibly can. There are a lot of jobs that may not come back. There's going to be a big wave of, hey, we can't afford you anymore or the business is shut down. I mean, even not just the addicts and people that are needing to feed their habit, but what about the people that realistically in a month or two months can't go to the grocery store and buy what they need? They can't make that payment. Their apartment or their house says, hey, uh, we're going to give you an eviction notice. And what do they got? So I can't imagine crime not going up 
Um, I also think, you know, we're going to see the heat of the summer. Typically, as a former police officer, I know when it gets hot, guess what? The, you know, bad people tend to come out. They tend to be nuttier. Now, if that nutty hot season happens about the same time that another resurgence of this virus comes out, and then you have individual entities, mayors or governors or whatever, say, hey, lock back down in, in your house with no air conditioning because you can't afford your electric bill. I just can't imagine it, it not getting a little bit hairy. And I want to add one more point to the thing. A lot of people maybe listening or watching this may not really get that. They may not be believing some of these things, probably don't believe a lot of it because you might be in a location like I am where if you didn't tell me this was going on, I would go out and other than a couple of blue pieces of tape on the ground in the stores, I'd be like, what's happening? I mean, everything looks kind of normal, but there's some signs and some doors. I haven't seen anybody sick, still haven't seen anybody sick. But if, you know, if you're not in New York or New Jersey or some of these areas where they have, they have seen it, they felt it, they've seen the ambulance, they've been in the ERs, it's, it's there. I think we're getting to the point where it's kind of hard to believe. So a lot of weird mental factors there too. A lot of it, I think, uh, when we're talking about the criminal aspect of it, as um, you know, most of you know, we live in a suburban area, or we live in an urban area. Uh, a lot of people don't really realize that at the lowest tier of employment, um, those are people who, uh, and I saw this when I was a kid growing up. You know, in the South, you may laughingly refer to us as white trash, but you know, the lower tier of employment. Some of my relatives. Uh, they would shift sort of between legal and illegal depending on what was available to them is, you know, if there was a job, they would take a job. But if the, the, the toothpaste tube was squeezed, you know, and pressure came down, people got laid off. They were the first ones to get laid off and they didn't see an issue because once again, they had to take care of their family. They didn't see an issue of shifting across a line. Dr. April, here. That's absolutely true. And, and locally, you'll hear it referred to by lots of different terms. You'll hear people talk about hustling. You'll hear people talk about ripping and running. Uh, and what it means is that they'll follow the path that gets them what they need. Uh, if I show up at your house, knock on the front door and ask if you have any odd jobs, I am willing to do those odd jobs. But if you don't answer the door and your gates open, I'm also willing to steal your lawnmower. Uh, these folks are going to do what it takes to get their needs met, even if they have to cross the line and cross it back. Uh, and that's something as desperation rises, you're going to see more and more. Mr. Pickus, it's something most people aren't, aren't, you know, again, having grown up in the South and seen it in my own family, uh, it seems perfectly normal to me that, that people would shift back and forth over the legal, illegal line. Uh, I know you, you, you know, I think you're probably familiar with a very similar situation, but most people in urban, uh, suburban, that's an alien culture to them. Well, not only, not only from that perspective, but, you know, in the Northeast, there's plenty of people who are known to uh, have a, a very, you know, oh, that must be a legitimate guy. He's got a legitimate business, everything that's going on. But in the back and then with the side and with protection and with this and with that, there's other monies being made and other things being done as well. So, you know, I'm very used to that um, from, from my side of the family up, uh, up north. So there, there is this. I think discomfort or, or it, there's an incredulousness that, you know, Seaclander uh, was talking about too, where people are just, no, that doesn't really happen. That's just in the movies or that's just, uh, that's, that's a tiny, tiny fraction of, of people. It's not. If you start asking around and you start, you know, really getting sincere commentary from people, we all know people who've done criminal activity. Uh, and some of us have probably done some, some little things here and there. And I'm not just talking about speeding in our own immediate family. We have people that we, we've interacted with, I'm sure in our friend circles. And as we start expanding that and you start thinking about your community, whether it's an urban community or a suburban community. Oh yeah. What about that deer that that guy took out of season? Was that a crime? Is that poaching? Is that, what is that? Well, is he just feeding his family? We're going to see more and more things like this as we get into deeper recession, retraction, another depression, whatever the technical terms are going to be, we have to be prepared for this. And this is something that Dr. April talks about all the time. And, you know, his, his contributions here, his contributions at Personal Defense Network, his classes. Don't think that can't happen. And don't try to make sense of it from your moral compass and from what you think is right or wrong. You really have to accept what somebody else thinks is okay. And that okay line is going to start shifting as they get more desperate, I think. Dr. April? As circumstances change, what will do changes. 
Uh, very early in my career, a patient was uh, kind enough to hip me to the, to the speed of the world. She said, the only reason you're not having sex for money in shoplifting is that you haven't had to yet. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Janich, I, I, it's to expand on what Dr. April said, I, you know, I, I was never critical of my relatives for doing that. And I, I've never, you know, having traveled a lot in the third world, as have you. I mean, I know you, you know, you know you've been around the world a dozen times. You know, both of us have been in cultures where people were doing uh, for a living things that we felt was hugely unacceptable. But the bottom line was they were in a situation where they needed to feed their family. Their children needed to eat. And that overrode, uh, the, quote, moral structures. Exactly right. It's hard to top Dr. April's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, um, you know, yeah. boom. I mean, what it is, you know, we like to... You know, we have this kind of stereotypical idea of a criminal is a bad person. Well, as the circumstances get more and more desperate and people are more and more challenged to feed themselves and feed their families, they don't become bad people. They become good people who are forced to do bad things to get by. Um, and again, the, the, moral, the moral lines start to shift, the sands start to shift, and what becomes acceptable for people to do, you know, it's like... Uh, again, you know, I wouldn't normally do this, but the circumstances require it. So I got to do what I got to do. And people start rationalizing, they start justifying what they do. And, you know, that's, that's survival. It's a survival instinct. Yeah. But, you know, Mike, can I add to that? Just Please. one point, I, I think, you know, one of the principles or the takeaways from this is we, we need to start thinking outside of our own boxes. We need to stop. We need to realize that we can't think about everything with our brain. Like my wife said the other day, we were talking about one of the teenagers. They did something completely stupid, which is very much like a teenager. And I was pissed <laughs> off. And, and she said, you, you got to stop thinking with your brain. She's not thinking with your 48 year old brain. She's thinking with a, with a 15 year old brain. And I'll give you a great example in terms of how we should look at this, you know, if you're watching this, is wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you, you need to remember outside of your brain and outside of your environment, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And a, a case in point was the other night, uh, our ice maker wasn't working great, ran out of ice, and I just said, okay, I'm going to run out and get a bag of ice. So I asked my wife, hey, do you want to go with me? This is probably 9.45, maybe 10 p.m. There's a gas station literally a block away. Uh, completely safe. She was going to stay in the truck. So we go and I pull into this parking lot and there's a couple cars at the, at the pump and there's cars like, like five or six or seven cars and people inside this gas station. I go in and, and one of these, uh, there's this girl talking to the main guy at the gas station, trying to get him to go to a party. She's drunk. There's another couple teenagers buying chips. So the short story version of this is there were probably a dozen drunk, stupid, high teenagers. So there, it's like the nightlife was out. It's like the vampires are out. And all of us older, responsible adults that are sitting there, you know, COVID-19, lockdown, we're in our house watching a movie on Netflix. We think that's what everybody's doing, but guess what? Probably every teenager in the neighborhood is out there drinking, partying, and spreading this stuff like wildfire. So it just showed, it taught me, because we're like, what is, is this zombie land? What is going on? This is just, we couldn't believe it. We don't know what we don't know. Like, we don't have any idea, really, what's happening outside of our environment. So we need to be aware of that, you know? Dr. April, you look like you had a comment there. Well, it's, it's also interesting because we're getting information at all levels, at all the time, right at the macro level, like uh, Michael's talking about. But also at the macro level today, some of the stuff we get can find is just, is just shocking. Uh, there was a, a mass survey done of a women's correctional institution here in the state and they recently found out that having tested every inmate in the facility, 85% of them are corona positive. But less than 10% were ever, were ever symptomatic. And so even the sand under our feet, the bottom of the, of the fraction, is changing so quickly uh, that we just can't. It, it, it's oftentimes difficult to feel confident in what you can even think, much less, much less what you can even know about where we are right now. And so keeping these micro, meso, and macro levels of understanding going at all times is really demanding. And I'd like us all to at least give ourselves a break about that. 
And uh, uh, Mr. Pinkus, I mean, coming back to something we said, first show, first comment. If all you do is you listen to the mainstream media, um, uh, you'll probably need to go into hiding because of the sheer level of depression. Uh, you, you cannot live immersively in this without being driven to depression, and you don't want what comes with the depression. No, not at all. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give my uh, almost weekly shout out to Walk the Talk America, WTTA.org, uh, mental health uh, screening, free anonymous screening and resources uh, powered by Mental Health America, a civil rights organization for people who are dealing with mental issues. Um, it's a great resource, obviously firearms friendly, because there are a lot of people that are, that are you know, dealing with depression, a lot of anxiety, obviously. I, I think taking what, what, the, the good side of, of what Seeklander was just talking about is that people are also out there working. People are out there shopping. People are out at the park. People are going for walks. People are playing catch. People are out with their dogs, out with their family. There are people taking field trips with their kids because they're homeschooling. The people are tired of being shut in doesn't necessarily mean they're out rioting at the state capitol or that they're out drinking in the middle of the night. Sure, a lot of that's going on. But there's also people out there being productive with their time. There's people doing positive things. There's people finding new projects to get involved in. And this one's been kind of a downer uh, this week, but, but there's still so many people I know who are looking at new business opportunities, who are taking on projects around the house, whether it's painting or restructuring or redecorating or whatever it is they're doing. It might be simple. It might be reading a book that you've always wanted to read. Now, there are plenty of people who are doing positive things with this time also. And, and I can assure you, based on the volume of traffic alone, because I am out and about, you know, I, I, I jokingly stayed, uh, you know, in one place without anyone else in this apartment for 24 hours last week, just to say I you know, was isolated and stayed at home at some point during this thing. But I'm out there all the time and the traffic is up, uh, you know, much to my dismay sometimes. There's more people standing around and the more businesses that open, the more parks that open, the less congestion we're going to have with 600 people standing in line at the Walmart. So I think there's some positives happening too in the reawakening of America and the moving forward. And people should, should, should focus on that a little bit as well and, and get out there and be part of it. Mr. Janich, so this is a, a controversial issue, but we've seen in some state protests, I'm specifically thinking Michigan, um, you saw a protest to, to, that was aimed at opening a state in the face of a governor who, uh, I think she's an Obensfuhrer, I'm not exactly sure what her, her status is, but, but you saw people on our side uh, decked out as if they were in Afghanistan. Uh, carrying carrying uh, ARs, AKs, various things. What are your thoughts on that? Carrying carrying uh, a we open carrying a weapon if you're protesting uh, the fact that you can't get your hair cut. Again, the, the the protest part of it, voicing your opinion, that's our right. But that is just, in my opinion, another aspect of the political aspect rather than addressing the issue itself and trying to figure out, okay, how do we address this problem? How do we get the economy moving? How do we really address the core things? Everyone is trying to manipulate it because they have other agendas. And I see that as just another reflection of that type of thing. It's like, I need to bring along my, my beliefs as far as gun stuff goes. I need to bring along my beliefs as far as fill in the blank, whatever, whatever your cause is, now suddenly that becomes tied into this thing because it's all being politicized. Focus on what we really need to try to achieve and stick to that. Mr. Pinkus, you had a, a follow-up comment? Yeah, I can attest to that. I, I did go down to the uh, Capitol building here in Denver to see what uh, was going to happen during one of the protests a couple weeks ago. And I was there for about 45 minutes on the edge of it. Uh, went down there with a buddy of mine who also is very involved in grassroots uh, Second Amendment stuff here in Colorado and nationally. And really just kind of observed to see what was up uh, from the edge of the Capitol area there. It was pretty sparse. But just in the half an hour, 45 minutes that I was there, one guy set up his PA system to evangelize about Jesus, our savior. Another guy uh, and small group was talking about uh, abortions are still going on and they were ranting about abortions over here. 
down in front, they were definitely people with the, the plate carriers and the militia look. Now, openly carrying a firearm is illegal on the Capitol grounds in Denver. So I didn't see any of that. However, 45 minutes after I left, in comes the guy with the Second Amendment shirt with his agenda openly carrying, and he ended up getting arrested. So, so there are definitely people out there co-opting this reopen America campaign for their own brothers and for their own, you know, probably selfish entertainment at some level, too. Dr. April, you had a comment there? Yeah, I think the majority of those kind of folks are getting uh, psychosexual and political needs met. Uh, they're certainly not getting, um, you know, getting any points made on the issue that they're actually there theoretically to protest. That's the equivalent of someone who stops you in the street, buttonholes you and tells you about their, their favorite conspiracy theory. Um, it, the, the, that sets us back in terms of reasonable protest um, more than it could ever hope to advance any cause. Well, I see we're, we're coming up uh, on an hour here. So let me do one quick go round. And what do our viewers need to know for next week, Mr. Seeklander? I, I hate to say it again. We don't know. We don't know. We're in the middle of it. I personally am making decisions based on, you know, like I pushed another class a little bit farther out because I'm, I'm wondering about what happens if this thing resurges a little bit and, and if that's more of a risk than it was in the beginning. So we don't really know. We don't know. I know Dr. April talked about it. You know, the number of positive cases in that particular prison or whatever was overwhelming with very, very little symptomatic individuals. I just don't know. We don't know. You know, you know, hold your fort down, you know, continue to do the things we've talked about. You know, if you're at this point, we're whatever, six weeks into this thing, we started talking, talking about it. If you haven't spent some time doing what Rob was talking about, you know, going on a picnic, spending time with family, reading that book you want to read, maybe doing a little bit of firearm, dry firearm, you know, hey, shame on you because you had a lot of time to do it. If you haven't finished those projects, uh, do those as well. Keep your head up. Watch the news. The news will suck you in the vortex. You don't want to get sucked in the vortex. Uh, and just keep yourself safe. Remember, I've learned from this, and I knew this already. I've never expected the police to defend my home. You are your own defender, self-defense. From a virus or from a thug on the street, you are your own defender. Mr. Janich, over the next seven days. Again, as things start to open up, uh, the dynamics are going to change. And again, that is going to be very localized. It's going to be very different from place to place. So we always talk about the basics. We always talk about basic concepts of keeping yourself as safe as possible. So look at what's going on around you. Look statistically at, what, at what's happening as far as a disease in your area. Look what's happening as far as crime in your area, any changes that you might notice. And, you know, just really try to pay attention to the environment that affects you most. And then again, be as well informed as you can possibly be. Uh, don't buy into the conspiracies and everything else. Really try to think for yourself and plan for yourself. Mr. Mr. Pincus, seven days out. What do we need? What, what do our viewers need to be looking at? I think people should really look at uh, not wanting to find an answer out there. I think we, we might know less than we did a month ago in terms of what's going to happen in the next week or two. I, I think that uh, at the beginning of March, I was perfectly happy to say this could be bad. I don't know. So I'm going to take a bunch of precautions. We're going to do these things. By the middle of April, we all said, okay, I think we're over the worst of it. And now we have to think about all these new questions moving forward. Well, now that we're doing the moving forward, it opens up a whole bunch of variables again, and that's okay. There's going to be risk. There's going to be unknowns. Um, I think accepting that for the next week is really important. And then uh, acting on what you do know and what you are comfortable with. I would uh, encourage everybody to not only support the businesses that are reopening, but specifically make some phone calls. Talk to the businesses that are opening. Talk to the restaurants that are opening and support the ones that you think are being the most responsible and reasonable in the way that they reopen. And maybe let them know. Um, you know, you don't have to it's easy to criticize and say, hey, your clerk touched their mask, and, you know, get some kind of, you know, I told you kind of superiority out of that. But it's even better if you can say, hey, I really appreciate all of the servers wearing masks and, and, and or the partitions and or the whatever and encourage responsible behavior. Dr. April, final thoughts? Well, I think that as we recognize that we're going to have the opportunity more to expand back into the world, our mitigation practices need to go up, not down. 
uh, as the interaction rate goes up, not just with ourselves, but with everyone else whose interaction rates are also going up, we have to be more careful. Uh, I'm being more careful about contact, about social distancing, um, doorknobs, et cetera, et cetera, because the, the end is rising and I have to be a good steward of my own health and also a good steward of the health, uh, you know, the possibility of me being a factor in someone else's health life. So as our, as our exposure goes up, so should our strictness about taking care. Very good, very good. So I, I always like to, to end these shows with uh, um, often a quote, thoughts from other people. And uh, many of you are familiar with Hannah Arndt, uh, the philosopher, a student of, of trying to understand the Holocaust. Of course, she covered the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the uh, architect of the Holocaust in Israel, which of course led to his hanging. And I thought it was interesting that, that her conclusion was she went looking for demons. She went looking for horrible, evil men who did absolute horrible things. But instead, what she found was a banality, the banality of evil. And one of the things that she talked about was the only consistency she saw was a shallowness, a calculated inability to think. And that was something that she carried with her through the rest of her life. And in one of her last essays, uh, she said that, that the inability to think is what has allowed people to, to do horrible things. And the manifestation of the wind of thought, I always like that, the wind of thought, is not knowledge, but the ability to tell right from wrong, beautiful from ugly. And I hope that thinking gives people the strength to prevent catastrophe in these rare moments when all the chips are on the table. And I think we're in one of those moments when all the chips are on the table. And so if I could leave you with any last thought, it's think. So thank you, Dr. April, Mr. Janich, Mr. Pincus, Mr. Seeklander. I'm Michael Bain. This is the Best Defense Survival Roundtable. We will see you next week.